Fred Frank, Frank Gore sharing his perspective on Golden's nuclear past. Uh, good evening. I noticed that uh, probably a nice evenly divided between uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. But what I'm going to do is talk about Golden and Rocky Flats through a thread of metals. Because after all, you heard my biography, all I know about are metals. I uh, worked my way through college uh, in summers as a laborer in a steel mill. Um, as you heard, I was a visiting scientist at the Conservation and Analytical Laboratories in Smithsonian Institution, uh, studying artifacts from the Negev Desert in Israel. So my background is going to be that of ancient metals and, and modern metals. And since Rocky Flats was basically, when you come down to it, a metals uh, fabrication uh, plant, except the metals were very exotic and radioactive, such as plutonium, uh, beryllium, and uranium. So let's talk a little about metals. And first of all, I want to say uh, the history of metals, one of the most significant and the most prominent uh, advances in the history of metals and probably in civilization because without metals you wouldn't have the kind of civilization we have today uh, was done by some very very smart and observant woman and I say that because back in the Neolithic um, where you had hunters gatherers in the beginnings of an agrarian society women were the ones who were doing the pottery and they were the ones who were smart enough and observant enough to know that you could take something as ugly as mud and fire it up in a kiln and turn it into something useful, a ceramic that could hold water, or better yet for the guys, well, wine and beer. But uh, they were also very observant. She was in the sense that one day she probably saw that she had lined her kiln with a green stones this time. This is a green stone. It's uh, malachite. It happens to be a copper carbonate uh, mineral that uh, you all know is a jewel like this. But she noticed that when she fired up her kiln with charcoal, etc., and so on, afterwards when it cooled down and everything, lo and behold, it miraculously transferred into this copper first smelting operation. Tremendous advance. Now of course they knew copper because it was uh, elemental. Uh, copper could be found in uh, many areas and they discovered that it had one great characteristic compared to that of stones, etc. and that is it's malleable, it's ductile. You can hammer it, you can do some useful shapes with it. It's a metal. Same with gold of course and the same with uh, silver. So probably, and we know, uh, as I did when I was at the Smithsonian, you had pendants, you had pins that were made from copper that was beaten uh, like this, found in its elemental state um, as early as 9,000, 10,000 BC. As I like to say, the first metallurgists were lovers, not warriors, with their gold and copper. Now, going from that and going into civilizations that are classical such as that Let's see, like me. Well, by the time we get to classical Greek metallurgy had advanced a good deal first of all somebody had discovered the fact this is a Greek bronze statue as you can see called the boxer uh, picture or listen to the music of uh, Simon and Garfunkel's song, The Boxer, you can picture this. This is a sculpture that, that shows a sculptor. He's got uh, a boxer in Greek Hellenistic times, 330 BC or so. This was found totally intact and analyzed very thoroughly. He's got the leather thongs instead of gloves. And of course, he's one bruised, beaten, weary individual. Um, the amazing thing is that to show the fact that he has a broken nose, his swollen face, uh, the sculptor not only did this beautiful form, but he also used the, the uh, bronze that was in here and varied the alloy content uh, to different varying degrees. 
He inlaid copper to show blood that may have been spurning. If he wanted to show swollen, he might use more copper instead of the tin. And by the way, the big difference was that somewhere along the line they discovered that if you mix that green stone with one of these stones that you found, and this is cassiterite, which is a tin oxide, that you came up with something that was much better than just pure copper. It could be cast and beaten into swords and spears, etc. And so, of course, by this time the guys took over and took all the credit. But you had the first alloys, and the alloys were uh, that of bronze. If you put up to 6% of tin into copper, you got a bronze that was great for swords, it was great for spear points. If you put in much more, that became brittle, but it was great for polishing into mirrors. This guy. If he wanted to show a little more red, he used a little more copper. And if he wanted to show something else, swollen, etc., he might use less. Just amazing what was being done. And of course, by this time, if you read the Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, you knew that they already had discovered uh, steel and quenching and tempering. And we know that because when uh, Ulysses blinds the Cyclops, the one-eyed giant, the uh, you, Homer compares it to that of plunging a sword into water, the flaming sword and a sizzle and all the gruesome things that go accompany with that. So we know that they are already quenching and tempering uh, iron into steel. Anyway, uh, what was happening over here in Golden at this same time? Well, we weren't quite into metals. In fact, uh, other than a few Indians in, in uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula where you had some native copper that you could work. The, the uh, Native Americans of North America, unlike the ones like the Aztecs in, because the Mochicas in, in South and Central America, never uh, got to the point of actually getting temperatures high enough to melt uh, the copper and, the, and silver, etc., and using lost wax uh, and making those beautiful artifacts that you see at the Denver Art Museum and so on. North American Indians never got above heating and, and uh, hammering some of it. So in Golden, uh, we had, of course, we had the Paleo-Indian cultures, the Clovis, the Fulce, and then uh, the woodland and the archaic in the woodland. And you're using atlatls and, and uh, spear points and et cetera that were made from materials like Flint, of course. Um, maybe occasionally obsidian. But it turns out that Golden was a very, very good place for tool manufacture. And we know this from the fact that uh, uh, we have a famous archaeological site called the Magic Mountain Site, 5JF223 for all the archaeologists in the audience. It's right, here's Heritage Square. It was called Magic Mountain because there used to be an amusement park here called Magic Mountain many years ago. Uh, the site is right below this little outcropping of lion's sandstone. And what was great about this for uh, the Paleo-Indians and subsequent cultures, mostly the woodland, all this before contact with a white man, of course, was the fact that you know, we're sitting on the Golden Fault. And unlike the San Andreas Fault, this is a good fault because it thrust up the mountains on this side for some 35, 40 million years ago. So a native could go up this side of the mountain, pick up the kind of uh, chert and uh, flint, etc., cetera, uh, that you could use to chip to make in, uh, those uh, stone points, or if you went east because of the fault, where you know we were beachfront property back in the Cretaceous because of the dinosaur tracks up at Morrison, etc. Well, you could also pick up petrified wood up on the mesas or on Green Mountain. And that also, uh, because it had a little agatized uh, center in it, was also a source of uh, uh, raw material for the uh, natives. And we know uh, about 25% of the 
projecto points were made from petrified wood. Let me back up. Because uh, we were excavating this site and you could statistically determine that. By the way, my, uh, I was dating my wife at the time uh, and we worked two summers on that archaeological site. Now, you can imagine a nerd like me, I figured a hot date was to take your a lady friend over and, and work in a sandbox for eight hours. And, you know, she still married me, I, I don't know why. But uh, all that, of course, this woodlands culture, the pottery making, that sort of a thing changed, as all even members know better than I, with the contact with a white man, discovery of gold in Gregory Gulch, and golden change. Now, one of the things about, of course, is there was mining here. We had coal mining. We had uh, the clay pits uh, for the Golden Brick Factory, of course, and, and uh, some alien stowaway named Adolf Coors built a little microbrewery over across in Clear Creek there. Uh, but the fact of the matter was that uh, the smelters up in Leadville and Central City and whatnot <coughs> couldn't handle all that. And plus the fact that the railroad that went up Clear Creek was narrow gauge and the one that was in Denver was um, standard gauge. So you had to unload the ore, put it into a, a standard gauge one. That made no sense. So some enterprising entrepreneur said, hey, why not just build the smelters right here in Golden, right at the entrance of the mountain and start that. So, you know, we had about five smelters at one time uh, with this one being the most prominent, the golden smelter. Now, smelting, remember I said, started by this smart lady back in ancient times, but by this time it got a little more complex. And uh, so you had to turn to some expertise because we were, after all, a town that was, as you all know, uh, could have been the capital of the territory and the state. Um, well, we had a school that could help. You know, Bishop Randall, Reverend Randall at the time in 1870, uh, started up this little Jarvis Hall and mining school and, and uh, you could take a course in gold assaying and start up your own shop. And there were assay shops everywhere around. So we were uh, at the center of, of the metals industry in, in one respect. And of course, uh, Things, again, as they always do with metals, they get complicated. The ores that were up in Central City, the, f the first ones were nice, just grains of gold in, in quartz, et cetera, and you could beat those up with stamping mills and break them down with grinding, et cetera. But now you got deeper, you got into these complex sulfide ores. And you couldn't do that just with stamping and maybe a simple mercury uh, removal, whatnot. So you call on some experts, and the experts, again, uh, associated with Golden in many respects. Uh, uh, here we have, as it says, these are silver paving bricks that came out of the smelter up at Black Hawk uh, for President Grant's visit to Central City at the Opera House in 1873. I mean, you know, culture was up here, not down in that town called Denver. Um, and this is Nathaniel Hill, a professor of chemistry from Yale University, came to uh, Black Hawk to solve some of the problems. He went to uh, Wales and to Germany where they had these complex sulfide ores, picked up some of that expertise and applied it to those sulfide ores over here. And uh, the boom was back on. Um, this is his uh, chief metallurgist in that wonderful, nice pose. Uh, uh, Roger Pierce, who was the chief metallurgist for the smelter, well, the tide into Golden, of course, he became one of the first uh, trustees on the board for the Colorado School of Mines, a territorial school that was uh, voted in by the legislature, and Roger Pierce became a professor. He became the professor of theoretical and practical metals. I love that title. It covers everything. <laughs> You got, you know, you could cover quantum mechanics and you can cover kitchen sink uh, beating whatever. But I love that title. So 
this is the kind of expertise that helped these smelters. The, you know, when the Guggenheims came and built, had a huge one down in Pueblo and up in Leadville and became a Sarco, et cetera. We're at the center of, of uh, metals. We're still not even in the, into the 20th century. But by the time, of course, boom and bust in the mining business and, and bust became uh, the Great Depression and, and the Golden and suffered. And so by the time you got into the 50s, uh, you know, this is a little later picture, but there you see the, our, our blessed uh, arch still. And, and there's the Holiday Hotel, Conoco Station, a little movie theater we had. Foss Drugs, of course, mainstay of the, of the street, angled parking. We were, it was a good place to live in the 50s. I mean, there, there was a stable community. We had um, Coors Brewery. It was no longer a little outfit, but if you remember the movie Smokey and the Bandit, you had to, Burt Reynolds had to smuggle that Coors beer over to the East Coast because you couldn't sell it east of the Mississippi River. The big thriving business, you know, if I went out on somewhere, I bought a six pack and brought it to my friends in Pittsburgh, uh, whatever. But still, uh, you know, we're not what you would say was a big thriving uh, bust or booming city economically. Well, mines. And I had a little lady <coughs> who could relate to this very well. I had did a little research for mines recently on some wall art for them, and one of the projects was a, an article that happened in Life magazine, November 24th, 1952. And the title really was 900 Men, One Co-Ed. co is not a word they use much anymore, women students. But this is Nancy Easley. Miss Nancy Easley was the only student. There were 900 uh, male students. The article went on with little photographs of uh, Nancy swimming by herself in the pool in the gymnasium because, as it pointed out discreetly in the caption, the boys didn't wear bathing suits back then. Uh, <laughs> she also was shown sitting on the sidelines of the field while all the boys uh, paraded in their uniforms because ROTC was mandatory for those first two years, and understandably so because the hot, Cold War was very hot, and I could have, I'll hold off. Um, the Cold War was very hot at the time. I mean, you had basically American Sabres uh, jets uh, fighting uh, against uh, Soviet-flown uh, MiGs, and uh, many of the mine students ended up uh, in that kind of a war and a conflict. And of course, at the same time, the uh, Soviet Union was building very large hydrogen bombs uh, and bombers to go with it. You know, the, it became a policy of deterrent. One where if our nuclear weapons are greater than yours or we're more or we're better, whatever, that's the policy that's going to prevent the Soviet Union from taking over the world and democracy falling, etc. At the same time, ours were being built and tested to be smaller in one respect, but with the same kind of a punch, because now you have bombers like the B-47, the B-52s, et cetera, and you had this newfangled rockets that you could put uh, as a missile, the warhead in, in the top of that. So all of you remember, those of you know history of students like myself ducking under the desks in, in nuclear war drills, et cetera. Um, and of course, the above ground testing was in, in full uh, force at the time because you had to test these weapons because the ones that were built by the Manhattan Project, the fat boys, the little boy, excuse me, fat man, little boys, those were weapons that would never fit uh, into these rockets uh, that were being built. Um, and so you had tests like this being at the time. So this is a picture, you know, and of course you had the nuclear power uh, at the time. The atomic age was here. Um, you had uh, the entire scenario of, uh, of atomic things coming on at, and at, uh, in the 50s and 60s. All right. 
It, wasn't a, it was a complete surprise to many because the Atomic Energy Commission, of course, uh, knew that it couldn't build all those weapons that it needed to fit into these new bombers and these new uh, missiles, etc at the old Manhattan Project down in Los Alamos. It needed production facilities. And one of the production facilities was to be built here uh, in Colorado. And so the Golden Transcript, excuse me, Colorado Transcript was uh, overjoyed. Golden had become home of the Atomic Workman $45 million plant. And just as important, there was going to be a free highway to Denver. Uh, the Boulder Turnpike was, of course, a toll road at this time. And the mayor of Golden said, we're finally going to have a damn good road from here to Boulder. Uh, and all the economic benefits that came with it. But of course, our rival up in Boulder said it's going to be in Boulder, you know, in, in a sense that <laughs> Boulder's going to get the $45 million atomic power plant, and uh, they're going to start the construction. It's only eight miles away. Well, the truth was, of course, it wasn't neither in Boulder or Golden. It was in Jefferson County at a site half, just about halfway between, out on in some godforsaken place that uh, was called Rocky Flats. And what, one of the things, though, that was concerned uh, to some of the state legislators or, or governor, et cetera, was the fact that, gee, are they going to build all these bombs out there, hydrogen bombs, et cetera? Well, the, the AC came back and said, no, they're not going to do that. They're just going to make components one critical component, but it's just going to be components. Some people had worried that, uh, because I don't know how many of you know the history of, of uh, Levere's, the DuPont Company town that was on the way to Castle Rock just off of 85. That was a town that made all the gunpowder, all of the dynamite, the nitroglycerin that was used up in the mines here in the Front Range in Colorado and other places, and occasionally the buildings blew up. So there was a cause for concern on that. Well, the AC said, no, you're not going to ever have a complete bomb out there of any kind. And that was the case. So what were they going to do in this little place or this nowheresville? In, the, in essence, there was nothing for miles except the church ranch. And notice the cattle guard. I love the Herefords for sale is what it really says out there and the first guard shack that uh, uh, was set up temporarily. So what was the mission of Rocky Flats as designated? All right, this is one of those cross sections of a thermonuclear weapon. Uh, you know, the CIA jokes are, if I show it to you, I'll have to kill you. Uh, this comes from Google Images. So, uh, <laughs> it, uh, but it does show basically um, yeah, you know, it's one of the, the jokes. If you have some lithium deuteride, if you have some beryllium, deuterium-235, plutonium-239, tritium, and uh, understanding the lens systems for the explosives here, then you could probably build this in your garage or not. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the important thing of this is that there are many, many components into a nuclear weapon. The primary thing, which is what every, some people call the trigger, or the, but mostly were called the pits, was this round thing up here, because this is where the fission took place. If you remember in the, uh, the tests in the Manhattan Project, the idea was to implode a sphere of plutonium-239 so that it went critical very quickly and produced the E equals MC squared that Einstein scrawled up many, many years before that. So for all that mass, you've got all this tremendous amount of energy. That's the nuclear bomb aspect of it. But the hydrogen bomb port of it, or the thermonuclear portion of it, down here is to convert the, into fusion energy, and that is to combine hydrogen into helium with the same E equals mc squared. So those whole two things. So the uh, you know, Atomic Energy Commission said Rocky Flats will build this section right here. And that includes uh, the plutonium, the uh, uranium-235, the beryllium, which is used as reflectors and so on, and maybe some stainless steel components, but not the explosives, none of the other aspects, and never complete a nuclear weapon out there. 
And the reason for this is they scattered the, into what was called the nuclear weapons complex. So the pits, so to speak, and some components were to be built here at Rocky Flats. Hanford could provide plutonium. Savannah River could provide plutonium. Um, the old uh, plants at uh, Y-12 and Oak Ridge, et cetera, and, and Paducah could uh, produce uranium. Uh, Mound could produce uh, plutonium isotopes for the neutron generators. Pinellas down in Florida would produce some filters, et cetera. The two competing uh, laboratories would design the modernized weapons that could fit in here. Sandia would do the electronics and the explosives calculations and some other things. And all of this then would, would ship to Pantex in mighty Amarillo, Texas, where the actual weapons were assembled and fitted into warheads. So that's the, the complex. And of course, this is very, very complex, transportation to all this, but Rocky Flats was in the center. There were a skilled workforce nearby, and uh, also the fact that, uh, that uh, it really was sort of in an isolated little spot out there at Rocky Flats at the time, back in the 50s. All right. What does it take now that you've said you're going to have uh, a production plant for these pits out in, at uh, Rocky Flats? Well, first of all, you've got to have security, right? Uh, this is, of course, a much later thing with when you get the Israeli concertino pan piano wire, uh, razor blade wire, machine guns, the whole thing. But uh, most important were your workers, the security, the classification. Everyone had a Q clearance, the highest secret clearance you could get for working uh, as far as the Department of Energy was concerned. That clearance meant that back in those days, the FBI came to your neighborhood and asked your neighbors, oh, you know, is that kid Fred Fraker, did he ever smoke marijuana? Did he, uh, was he ever talk about communism and real stuff in a favorable way? All that stuff. Of course, I, had, I was an officer in, in the Army, so it, it helped when I got out of graduate school and came to Rocky Flats. But that was always uh, a criteria. Later on, it, it separated down into various levels and so on. But uh, security of personnel was a big, big thing. And uh, well, you may have started with 1,000. You ended up maybe with an uh, employment force of 8,000. All right, now let's talk some metallurgy. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about what it still took, because plutonium is a metal. You can see it right here. It's a dull gray. Uh, it's melting point somewhere around aluminum, and it's heavy. It's heavier than lead, uh, gold, et cetera. If he were to lift this up in this or in these gloves, and he's protected by the glass you don't see here, the plexiglass and the lead line gloves, if you were to lift that and drop it, it would make a big thud. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to pass around a sample of that as I did with a cassiterite or ever. But that was one, you know, and it's radioactive. It's an alpha emitter and a neutron emitter, and so it had to be handled and protected in things like, no matter what you were doing, in glove boxes. And so you came up with these arrays of, of glove boxes uh, that uh, if you go to the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum in Arvada, they have an exhibit where you can put your hands into a glove box and you will see what it takes to work inside of a glove box. If you want to move something over to here, and while few had conveyor belts or whatnot, you put your hands in there, you moved it over one, took your hands out, monitored yourself for uh, if any contamination may have happened, moved it into the next gloves, the next gloves, and so on. And everything, um, as you said, if, when you see at the Rocky Flats Museum that uh, you put your hands in there, it's, it's, it's worse than hugging a bear because you're out here, but also those gloves are so thick, you're not going to do fine point embroidery needlework with it. Uh, it. It is something that you took into consideration. All this, again, uh, had to be built up. You wanted to transport something across the way. You had to bag it out in plastic, et cetera, monitor all the times with a uh, face mask because the reason 
Plutonium is really the most hazardous is because as, as an alpha emitter, which is little helium particles, they're very ionizing radiation. If you ingest it, it will uh, start ionizing and, and destroying cells around it or inducing uh, uh, malignancy or whatnot and changing it. So very, very careful considerations. Training personnel is a big thing. For the most part, if you weren't working in glove boxes, you could uh, wear normal things, but you always wore booties, you always monitored yourself, and I should point out, in a laboratory like this, um, all the air that went, went into the building, the air in the building then went into through uh, doors, uh, double doors that went into, say, a hallway, they went into the laboratory in this case, uh, the air went always in, into into the glove box, et cetera. So if there was an escape, there was a try and, and contain it within that glove box. But um, again, if you were not working in a thing, you could work this. I always wore a white lab coat because it made me look like a real doctor, right? All I needed was a stethoscope and I could do this as a scientist. And of course, if you were going to do the very complex things that you needed, remember, we're talking about taking a metal and shaping it the way that first metal smith did by heating it, treating it, turning it into a shape. That button isn't going to do you any good in terms of being into that complex, perfectly machined, to incredible tolerance kind of a thing that you're going to make a pit from. So you've got to do that. And in the case of, at one point, electron beam welders were the absolute cutting edge, or bad pun, because actually it didn't cut, it actually joined. Um, in, in terms of, we had more electron beam welders and skilled people that could do uh, electron beam welding than any aerospace plant or any other facility in the United States, probably the world. Um, so that's the kind of a thing that Rocky Flats was when it was in production. All right, let's talk about plutonium as a metal because that's what I'm going to weave this thread with. Um, in technical terms, um, from a metallurgist standpoint, Plutonium sucks. It, uh, let me get into solid state physics for a while and take notes because there's going to be a quiz. Uh, most metals are made of composed of a lattice with the atoms on the corners of a, of a cube. So you have, a, say, a, your kitchen sink, uh, stainless steel. You'll have an iron atom on each corner. You might have one in the face, or you might have one in the body center, depending on the metal and, and a little bit of impurities to make it harder and so on. Not so with plutonium. At room temperature, pure, pure plutonium is what we call monoclinic, meaning there are no right angles, no lengths. It's something called a parallelogram in space, and only crystallographers and their mothers must, must enjoy it, because the properties are, are terrible in terms of trying to to work it, to make it and shape it. Well, what do you do? Well, you did what that smart woman did uh, way back in ancient times. You alloy it, so you get one of those phases. It has the other bad thing about plutonium is it has six allotropic phases, meaning it goes to phase changes from this monoclinic phase to a cubic phase to the orthorhombic, a whole bunch of things, all accompanied with density changes it expands when it, when it uh, solidifies as a liquid like ice. Terrible stuff to work with in, in terms of pure. So you put something in it. Well, for a while it was a secret that was gallium. One way percent of it will turn it into that nice face-centered cubic lattice that the metallurgists dearly love and can work with. But you've got to have to do some research to do this because absolutely, even though you alloy it, uh, you got to call on some of the best experts in, in physical metallurgy. Um, when I was a group leader of a group called Physical Metallurgy Research and Development uh, under Dow Chemical, we had um, oh, about a dozen PhDs, one from Stanford, one from Reed, um, you name it, Colorado School of Mines, of course. And of course, uh, we had students and graduates coming from School of Mines. We had, I had two summer students uh, who helped me uh, in the summer and became executives later on in, at Rocky Flats uh, uh, in, from Colorado School of Mines. This is a cross-section of, of uh, 
as you see, uh, plutonium one weight percent gallium. And the technical thing of this is that when you first start with it, the gallium doesn't just being a nice dispersal homogeneous, so to speak. There will be more <coughs> gallium in the center and depleted in these green boundaries. Uh, this is an optical photomicrograph. So you've got to homogenize, like the ancients used to do with their steel and try and quench and temper and so on. You've got to figure out the right temperatures. You've got to figure out the right compositions, what to do with it, um, how to make it, et cetera, and you go to experts for it. Now, of course, Nathaniel Hill and Roger Pierce are long gone. They're interred at Riverside or someplace like that. But we had the best metallurgists and, and uh, metals metallurgical engineers right here at the Colorado School of Mines. When I was uh, manager of the physical metallurgy group, I had at least four faculty members who had Q clearances who consulted with me, uh, and my scientists mostly, um, that uh, on to uh, problems that, that uh, occurred in this kind of metallurgy of, of a metal as, as exotic and uh, as plutonium. Uh, we also had them from DU and Colorado School of, or uh, CU, et cetera, of course. But the expertise required uh, Rocky Flats at that time was probably the center of, of nuclear metallurgy in, in the complex uh, at the time in the, in the 70s and 80s. And yeah, I was probably the first scientist to look at the metal plutonium, one weight percent gallium in, with transmission electron microscopy. Optical microscopes weren't enough. You, instead of using light beams, you can take electron beams and you can use magnets instead of lenses and you could take a look at right through the, the metal if you thin it thin enough. And again, plutonium was really terrible because even in a vacuum it would turn into an oxide. And beryllium wasn't much better. better. It's hexagonal close packed instead of cubic. Uh, this is a little this little black spot right here is iron and aluminum. The atoms gather together and they stick like this. These little lines here in transmission electron microscopy, and I won't go into detail, but this is what makes metal a ductile. When you bend it, you generate these things and they move. They're called dislocations. This one's being held up by this little precipitate. If this was copper in an aluminum alloy. It's what strengthens the aluminum alloys so your rings on your jet aircraft don't fall off. Some of the lesser known uh, technology things out there in, in groups, um, this is a laser target, and I'll explain this, but this is a human hair. So when I say precision machined and small, I'm, I'm talking about precision machining. Turns out that my son who graduated from Colorado State University is a uh, a uh, mechanical engineer. He started at mines, finished his freshman year with good grades, but said there weren't enough girls and they were all smarter than he was, so he transferred <laughs> to CSU. Hey, you know, what can you do? Um, but the fact is, this little thing, uh, if coated with things like gold, etc., becomes a target when it's filled with hydrogen uh, isotopes, deuterium, etc., that you can implode this with lasers and you get fusion, as you did with a, not with a weapon, but you can get the same amount of E equals MC squared energy out of it. Then you've got a fusion reactor, something that doesn't produce the kind of radioactivity that you get in a nuclear fission reactor, uh, has no radioactive waste, has great promise. Lawrence Livermore just got up to, a, I don't know, 500, tetrawatts of energy that they could pump into these targets. Um, and they're at the point where they call so-called ignition point, where they'll get more energy out than they put in. If that happens in the next few decades or so, you'll have a wonderful uh, source of, of uh, energy because you have billions of years worth of, of water in the oceans, et cetera, that you can use for this. But that's a little known one. Another little known one was the fact that uh, while we never had completed weapons out at Rocky Flats, I had taken over a group uh, called the Model Shop out there that uh, actually was in a vault in the basement of a subterranean basement 
and very few people could get in. You had to have a special clearance to get this because what, they, what we did was to construct mock-up models of nuclear weapons that were used by the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army that handled the, the, the actual nuclear weapons. And you made these out of non-fissile materials, of course, not radioactive stuff. And the, what was always amazing to me, we had artist engineers who could take a blueprint of a weapon, or, you know, and it, you know what a blueprint looks like, and it's far more, it's really complex in a, in a weapon. Take that, turn it into a drawing that you could use in, on any magazine or in museum dioramas. We built museum dioramas for the classified museums at the laboratories. This is a uh, weapon that, on the, where he's got the cutaway over there, obviously it would be used for training. This one I think went to the White House for some uh, exhibit to, I think it's President Reagan, uh, to show uh, advances in, in uh, the technology, et cetera. But um, it, it's just one aspect. Never any uh, complete weapons, but there were, was one little shop that, that had the knowledge of, of what was being built. All right, so we go through production of some other things out there. Obviously, very complex. You could do uh, beryllium rings, which nobody else in the country could do. Um, stainless steel components, and you could see the various kinds of parts that you made. Then you made them in the thousands. I think it's estimated somewhere, I think from the Cold War Museum records, that there were something like 70,000 pits built at Rocky Flats. And you can imagine with the stainless steel components, the beryllium's and much smaller things, that you had many, many more of those. In one of the phases, the development phase, phase four or five, uh, every third part was pulled off the assembly line, cut apart, destroyed, and examined to see that it was made to the exact tolerances that, that you had uh, been given by the uh, Department of Energy to get their diamond stamp, which was their stamp of approval. Um, of course, when you've got something this complex, and this with materials that you have like plutonium, uranium, beryllium, and complex, and it's true whether it was the space program, Apollo 13, or Challenger, or anything like this, you are going to have uh, errors and, and mistakes and, and uh, catastrophic kinds of things. This is a fire glove box that uh, happened because, as I said, plutonium is, uh, oxidizes very readily. A little water vapor has a hydride that is pyrophoric. You scratch it when you uh, when you, uh, with a file or whatever, and you'll see the sparks coming. Uh, this one happened to ignite spontaneously when nobody was there, and as a result started burning the gloves and the flammable plastic, which was at the time. Um, and I, I can tell you about uh, climbing on a scaffolding and, and helping to clean up this thing for a week uh, in great detail. But this these kinds of incidents and, and the risk that was involved and the fact that uh, Arvada was no longer a little railroad in downtown merchant place and um, people were moving in up to Indiana and you had uh, serious concerns about the radiation hazards, et cetera, and so on. All this became uh, uh, much more active, but it was all a moot point in the sense that there was no use for Rocky Flats anymore. Uh, with the advent of the, the ending of uh, the Cold War, with the signing of test ban treaties, reduction in nuclear weapons, verification tests had been made. Uh, this is a cap that was a commemorative cap. Rocky Flats built a pit for a joint Soviet-U.S. test out at the test site, underground test by then. Um, you can see the bear and the eagle, the bear, the Russian bear, and the Soviet and the U.S. eagle. Uh, to test and make sure they knew exactly what the results were from any kind of testing, even if it was underground. So today, of course, you know instantly who, if a, a, a nuclear weapon is detonated anywhere in the world. You have satellites nowadays that can to do that if it was an above ground explosion as well. So Rocky Flats was, was mission was in an end. There's no need to have all of this. Uh, and, so its mission changed to that of 
decommissioning and decontamination of buildings. Everything wiped down, clean, packed in the barrel, shipped to waste isolation sites like the WIT plant, uh, uh, INL and other sites, uh, and the buildings uh, themselves destroyed, and demolished. Uh, some of the shots that you have. And so what was Rocky Flats at that time in 1991, by the way, this is Central Avenue, which basically divided the plant. This is the plutonium side, so to speak, the hot side. Um, and this is where stainless and beryllium and uranium uh, were, were built. And by the way, um, one of the things that uh, was done at Rocky Flats near in the 80s and whatnot was to work on the metallurgy of depleted uranium. Depleted uranium is where the 235 isotope has been almost all totally removed from it and you're left with this 238, which is the same stuff that's the dust on the floor here uh, from, because you know, of course we're big uranium site because of that Cretaceous uh, formation known as the Dakotas. Uh, and that, uh, that depleted uranium was used as the sabots, the, the center of, of uh, the weapons that, that were fired from the ta Abrams tanks in uh, Desert Storm, the, uh, the Iraqi war that uh, would demolish the tanks because again F equals MA and you had these uh, uranium penetrators that could go through the Iraqi armor. Uh, that depleted uranium uh, is in one respect Two individuals uh, who had worked with me uh, started the, a facility. At, um, they started here as young entrepreneurs after they, they left Rocky Flats and went to Oak Ridge, got the capital and started up a plant to do that sort of a thing. Uh, they were mines graduates, by the way, um, and successfully sold that operation. So. That's Rocky Flats now, although it's grown over weeds. It, of course, has become the Rocky Flats Wildlife uh, Refuge and the Prairie Dogs were eventually taking it over. Um, if you see activity out here in the front gate, et cetera, and trucks and everything else, that's uh, from the gravel pits that church was very wise in, in the ranch uh, in keeping the mineral rights. Uh, I mean, there is coal under here. Actually, there are mines that extend out under that uh, uh, public service used for years to store natural gas. Now, I guess Arvada is going to use them to store water. And so, Rocky Flats is being shut down. Well, you're talking about 8,000 workers. You know, average salaries were as good as anything in aerospace. Even back in 1980, economic impact to Boulder, Arvada, Golden, et cetera, is $140 million. It's probably double that uh, in the 90s and so on. So, you know, there's obvious concern about the fact that Rocky Flats is going to be shut down. What are we going to do, et cetera? And, and DOE uh, had some programs going. One of them was to create the Rocky Flats Local Impacts Initiative, which, of course, because of the politics between Boulder and Jefferson County, ended up having two co-directors, uh, but they were to provide training programs, some economic development programs. And I was at Colorado School of Mines, of course, uh, and doing seed grant programs or uh, giving out grants to faculty members. And a, a colleague and I came up with an idea, why not uh, help, because Rocky Riffley uh, wanted to put an emphasis on technology-based startups. And my idea was, hey, you've got all this expertise at mines. You've got all the expertise at CU, DU, et cetera. Why not put together teams of faculty members and uh, an entrepreneur, less than 25 employees, et cetera, in the area and give them a seed grant, $100,000, $75,000. Not venture capital, but enough to help with the technical expertise on a project for the development of their invention, prototype, whatever. Um, the, by the way, this one is an article from Rocky Mountain News. Uh, the reporter didn't want to see uh, a talk about the teams of somebody looking at software or doing something like that. 
So we had one individual who uh, was an entrepreneur who designed a, a new firefighting suit that, uh, and hazmat suit that was uh, cooled by liquid nitrogen. And I said, well, this guy will volunteer to set himself on fire. Is that good enough for you? And he said, oh, yeah, that's what we want. <laughs> so you got a picture of that. Uh, just to show you, we would give competitively, and I want a uh, $1.75 million grant from DOE uh, to do start to, con to fully implement this program. So we'd have a faculty member and his students, and they would team up with an entrepreneur. One of them was a little, little shop here in Golden that made uh, stereolithograph images and molds of, uh, they would digitize a CAT scan, let's say of a jaw, because they wanted to do an implant. Somebody was in a uh, major accident. You might want to have that absolutely precise. So you took a CAT scan, digitalized that, and then you could, stare with stereolithography, where you use a laser beam and you catalyze the uh, plastic that came up with a mold. So you could, like, for example, have a full skull. Well, this company is out on West Colfax. They now do modeling for surgery. They, they were the ones that modeled stuff for the separating co-joined twins. Um, they are, are the leaders in, in doing innovative stuff in in uh, the kind of taking MRI and CAT scans and helping surgeons, dentists, and so on. Um, another company, a little chemist out at, at Rocky Flats named Gil Brazel. Um, this is a nuclear waste thing, and of course, like a landfill, it generates methane uh, if there's a lot of paper and stuff like that, organics. He devised a way of, of putting in a nuclear filter from uh, charcoal, et cetera, that would separate any radioactivity uh, materials that might come out of that, and not only the gas escape, uh, and started his own company called Nuclear Filter Technology, Inc. That company now is doing stuff, again, out at the uh, corporate circle, if, uh, out on West Colfax. They, uh, they do things uh, like laser welding uh, systems, in addition to the containers and designs and engineering. Uh, nice success story. Not all of the grants were success stories, of course. But um, another one that wasn't Mines, but, um, and Mines did one that was for solar cells. Uh, company um, is located in, in Lakewood, but uh, was originally uh, started here in Golden. Uh, the one that you probably relate to is when you go to the movies and you put on your 3D glasses. There was a, I'm going back to smart women again, but. There was a smart professor at, at CU in electrical engineering. She uh, came up with an idea for some better photonic cells that, that could translate color for TVs and things like this, and built up a, a company, um, ColorLink, which in turn was bought out by Real D. So when you put on your glasses and you go to a, a 3D thing, that technology, which you'll see the Real D in 3D uh, Corporation, they're expanding in, in Boulder as, uh, as of last week. Um, that's a company that came out of the Entrepreneur's Technical Assistance Program. All right, let me end up, what's left at Rocky Flats besides the Gophers, et cetera? Well, uh, the wind site. Uh, few people know that uh, Rocky Flats was the founder of wind energy uh, in research in Colorado. My office at one point was right on the western end of this building, which you'll s still see out at uh, the corner of 93 and 128. Only now, we were doing small and medium-sized wind energy. Uh, when NREL took it over, et cetera, they moved into the big wind turbines, the megawatt kind of power that you all know, know um, and from the plains and, and uh, up near Cheyenne and, and out in eastern Colorado. Um, I had the best office. I mean, that, that view out into the uh, front range was just spectacular. So I put it on the back of one of my recruiting brochures when I went to uh, the universities around the country and, and hired some of the brightest engineers, et cetera, and said, hey, my office is right there. You know, that's what I like. Um, <laughs> it was true. That was the best office I ever had. Um, all right. Let's end up where we started. Um, I told you I was a visiting scientist at Conservation Analytical Labs in the Smithsonian. 
Um, anyway, this is a, an arrowhead Philistine. It does obviously bronze was because if you, you can barely make out, but the sand grains there, this is reverting back to its semi-equilibrium state. It's going back to that malachite, the azurite, um, as the corrosion occurs. There's almost no metal left in here. It's now all CuCO3, OH, whatever. Um, and over here we have a British, uh, a 303 British Enfield steel jacketed bullet. These were found just meters apart in the archaeological site that I was looking at. I didn't get to go to Israel. I had to stay in the basement of Smithsonian and look at these things with microscopes. But um, in fact, they were found, you know, just meters apart. And obviously, although they've been 4,000 years apart, uh, it was probably fired somewhere in one of the many Israeli conflicts. Bottom line is, nowadays, the nation of Israel has a nuclear arsenal. Uh, Iran, of course, one of their arch enemies, is working on one. You get to the point that uh, you have 4,000 years of history, but you have places like Pakistan and uh, India and China and probably North Korea that are going into nuclear weapons. So it, it isn't one where we're going to have no nuclear weapons in the near future, but it won't be in Rocky Flats. All right, we've covered 4,000 years. Thank you.